Mali is not exactly a well-known tourist destination. Located in West Africa, at the southern edge of the Sahara, there aren't the game parks that East Africa is famous for. 700 years ago, this area was one of the richest in the world as it controlled gold, salt, and other trade, both along the Niger River and in the caravans crossing the Sahara. The legendary city of Timbuktu, at the meeting of the Sahara Desert and the Niger River, was not only a major trading center, but also a world leader in education in the 1500s. Today, Mali is one of the poorest countries in the world, facing problems of insufficient food and water, drought, desertification, public health epidemics, and more. Tourism is a small, bright spot in the economy, providing jobs for 160,000 people and growing at a rate of about 4% a year. Our trip starts in the capital city of Bamako, on the banks of the Niger River. Even with over one and a half million inhabitants, Bamako is one of the least developed capital cities in the world. Our local guide called it a big village with only a couple of tall buildings, and the tallest of those is just 14 stories. At night, the only visible lights are those lining the major bridge across the Niger. Our hotel is right on the river. Here, with the Sahara so close, water is life, and the Niger is the heart of Mali. Even the breakfast room at the hotel has a nautical theme. Bamako is a bustling city with relatively few cars and trucks, but lots of minibikes, public minibuses transporting both people and goods, and hand carts galore. There are many sidewalk businesses, and we see foosball tables almost everywhere. Heading out of Bamako, we saw more and more donkey carts, and even a few horse and ox carts. This one is carrying water from a distant well. Most homes don't have running water. Either women carry it from town wells, or, if they have a cart, Kids may be sent to fetch it. Electrical power has come to many villages in the last five years, but few people can afford to hook up. There aren't many landline phones, but cell phone coverage is widespread. Our trip leader even had coverage when we were bush camping on the banks of the Niger River. Eighty percent of Malians are subsistence farmers, cultivating their fields by hand. A major problem facing Mali is desertification, as more and more land is cultivated and exposed to wind erosion. Little by little, the Sahara is creeping southward, perhaps by as much as a half mile a year. A related problem is deforestation, as most people use wood for cooking, and live trees are increasingly cut down for fuel. While there are a number of tree planting programs sponsored by aid organizations, the trees have to be protected from the amazing number of goats and sheep. Creative barricades surround most young trees. and people try to provide other fodder for the livestock. We saw numerous places making mud bricks, primary building material. And a few moderate-sized building projects. The main highways are two lanes, 
well paved with few potholes. Lagu, a town on the Niger River, was our first stop. This area is part of a large inland delta, or marsh. Despite the good road from Bamako, life in Segu revolves around the river. As we leave Sagu, baobab trees appear along the road. Kids suck the seeds inside the pods as a sweet treat. Along the way, we see cattle, goats, and sheep. Not to mention numerous vehicles reminiscent of the Beverly Hillbillies. Mali has one of the highest birth rates in the world, with over eight children per woman. We see kids and pregnant women everywhere. Unfortunately, the country also has one of the highest infant mortality rates. This is largely due to malnutrition, cholera, and malaria. Heading to Jenny, an island city in the Bani River, we're in the heart of the Inland Delta. And the countryside is green instead of the drab brown that characterizes so much of Mali. While we wait for the ferry to Jenny, local merchants appear to tempt us with their wares. Popular offerings include simple jewelry, CDs, textiles, and wood carvings and each of the young men swears that his name is Mr. Good Price. Women, often with babies on their backs, sell food at every stop along the road. Jenny is the first of the World Heritage sites we visit. In fact, it was a 2001 National Geographic article about Jenny that made me first want to visit Molly. The masons of Jenny began building with mud bricks over a thousand years ago, and gradually the style spread to other cities in the region. Still, Jenny's masons, the secrets passed from father to son through the generations, remain the masters. While almost every building in the city is built of mud, it's the mosque that everyone comes to see. The largest mud building in the world Local residents apply an additional layer of mud every year before the rainy season. The present building is over a hundred years old. Seeing the Jenny Mosque is a huge thrill for me, and we've been told that non-Muslims may not enter. Our local guide, however, surprises us by arranging with the Imam for our group to go inside. Shoes off, knees and shoulders covered, we enter. While we've been inside the mosque, Jenny's Monday Market has been getting underway around it. Trucks, buses, donkey carts, ox carts, hand carts, bicycles, people on foot are all converging on the main square of town. While a few homes in Jenny have running water, most get it from wells. The well where the women are is the free well with water for washing, pulled up by hand in buckets. The water spigot on the left has pure water for drinking, but it must be paid for. Women used to do their laundry and other washing in the river. 
Now, with Neighborhood Well, they wash at home. With no sewer system, dirty water flows in the streets. A Dutch aid organization, the same one that built the well, is now working on a solution. Bogalon, or mud cloth, is a specialty in the Jenny area. Strips of hand-woven cotton are dyed with tree leaves, bark, and mud. While the fabric is also used by local residents, sales to tourists provide a bit of extra income to the women. Our next stop, Mopti, builds itself as the Venice of Africa. While that's a bit of a stretch, it is a major port city located where the Bani River joins the Niger. Shops selling everything imaginable line the harbor area. And there's a boatyard, complete with blacksmiths making tools and nails, one by one, over open fires. We watch as panassas are loaded with everything under the sun. And another Mr. Good Price tries to get our attention. From Mopti, we'll spend three days aboard a panace to get to Timbuktu. Here, we see the results of a tree planting project and pass by numerous riverside villages. The panace is comfortable. Our cook, in red, keeps our tummies full as the boat crew keeps us safely on course to Timbuktu. Mid-morning, we get tea and smiley cookies. We pass lunch plates back and forth and eat well. Still in the inland delta, we see lots of birds, as well as nests. An outboard pushes us along, 
and occasional floats mark the channel. There's even a toilet of sorts. In the afternoon, we stopped to visit a village. Children took us by the hand and proudly showed off their schoolwork. Unfortunately, most of the kids, and even some of the adults, clamored for cadeau, that's French for gift, with their hands outstretched. Some people offered services to tourists, such as this man giving massages. And that was great. We were pestered for handouts so often that it seemed the kids saw begging as perfectly acceptable. Aboard the Pinas, we discussed responsible tourism, that is, tourism that works within the local economy and rewards those who work, not those who just say, give me. Evenings, we bush camped on the riverbank quickly setting up our tents so that we could enjoy a sunset beer. For dinner, our cook prepared feasts with soup, an entree, and fruit for dessert. Morning saw us back on the river before the sun rose. been told to expect hot weather in Mali, with daytime highs in the 90s. Instead, we got unseasonably cool weather in the 70s. Combined with 20 mile an hour winds and spray, we were more than chilly and piled on the clouds. We're more than happy to take a break and visit another school. The kids love seeing themselves on our digital camera. A highlight of the river trip was a stop in Nia Funke, where Grammy Award winning Ali Farka Toure lives and has a hotel. The music accompanying the first half of this DVD is all his. We take a quick look around the local market. And then stop for drinks at the hotel. Here, we met Ali Farka Toure himself, and he autographed my copy of his album. Our final day on the river begins with a gorgeous sunrise, and it's clear that we're out of the inland delta and moving rapidly towards desert. A shout from the captain alerts us to a hippo in the water. This is our one and only big game sighting of the trip. As we continue, it gets colder and wetter, and we are more than ready to end the finance trip. Maybe it's only fitting that getting to Timbuktu isn't exactly easy.
We arrive at Timbuktu Port in mid-afternoon. Timbuktu plays the same role it has for centuries, a center of trade between the nomadic Tuareg of the Sahara and the Malian merchants who supply goods via the Niger, which flows just 10 miles south of town. The first European explorer didn't reach Timbuktu until 1826, after a long and arduous trip over the Sahara. Timbuktu became synonymous for any distant and dangerous destination. Today, Timbuktu is a World Heritage Site, and the local tourist office will stamp your passport to certify you've been there. While nothing compared to the challenges faced by the early explorers, our trip up the Niger River was just rough enough that we are thrilled to see the big city of Timbuktu, with all its comforts, appear on the horizon. Hot showers, real beds, electricity, and more await us at our hotel. There's even a cold beer. In the bar, we meet a Tuareg jewelry merchant who speaks excellent English. Most Tuareg men, it seems, are also craftsmen and make beautiful jewelry, decorations, and other items. Periodically, one of the family will take the items they've made, plus some beautiful camel skin items made by the women, and travel two weeks or more by camel to Timbuktu to sell them and then send rice and other staples back to the village. All the Tuareg we met, including our local guide, said that they came to town just long enough to get the sufficient money and supplies to go back to the desert. There, the women and children live in villages, while the men live more nomadically, moving the animals, typically camels and goats, from place to place to find food. When they come to Timbuktu, many of the Tuareg bring their tents and live in them to save money. Kids attend schools on street corners, memorizing verses of the Quran on mud-covered pieces of wood that serve as lights. Outdoor beehive ovens are all over Timbuktu. Constant sand in the air means that all the bread has a slightly gritty texture. In 1999, a library of ancient manuscripts was begun in Timbuktu. These old documents, up to a thousand years old, had been owned by individual families and stored in chests. Over 35,000 documents have now been donated to the library, and local residents have been trained in conservation techniques to preserve them. Looking out over the Sahara, we decide to visit a Tuareg camp and do it by camel. A young man walks beside me, speaking perfect English. Abraham tells me that he is 16 and has gone by camel to Morocco, a 54-day trip. He tells me that if you travel three days north, 150 kilometers, the Sahara becomes nothing but sand. Traveling more than 800 kilometers across that fearsome terrain, Abraham has already made two trips to the salt mines with his father, a 46-day journey each direction. To the left, you can see a well. This one is modern, machine-drilled and lined with concrete. Older ones were hand-dug in soft sand and lined with logs, and many Tuareg died in building them. Our local guide tells us that wells in the Sahara are now about 300 feet deep and having to be dug deeper every year. The Tuareg's biggest fear is that oil will be found in the Sahara and make their nomadic lifestyle impossible for their children. Abraham, who explains so much about their life, is in the dark blue on the right. 
The other two boys led Dave's and my camels. Like all Taurag men, Abraham makes and sells jewelry, such as this bracelet I bought from him. The Taurag women sang a few songs for us. Although Muslim, the Taurag are unusual in that the men wear veils over their faces and most women do not. The next morning, we say goodbye to Timbuktu and cross the Niger River again. We're heading to the final highlight of our trip, trekking in Dogon country. The road is just a wind-blown, dusty track across the Sahel. That's the term used to describe the transitional land that's wetter than the true desert, but drier than the savanna south of here. Most of Mali is tabletop flat but the Bandagaria escarpment rises about a thousand feet above the surrounding plain and is home to the Dogon people. We've planned a four-day trek in this area, visiting numerous villages nestled along the cliff face. The Dogon moved to this area over 500 years ago and continue to live much as they did then. Many are animists, believing that spirits inhabit everyday objects like rocks and mass. Today, the majority of the Dogon live on the plain where it's easier to cultivate fields and tend to animals. But it's the villages along the escarpment that have been designated as a World Heritage Site, and it's those that we will visit. A sandstorm is kicking up as we begin our trek. Our Dogon guide, Dao, warns us not to touch certain rocks and other places that are sacred. The Dogon use ancient structures left by the Telem as cemeteries and have elaborate burial rituals. Using Dogon ladders for the final 10 feet. We reach the top of the escarpment. Yes, the Dogon have a Mr. Good price. And I buy two pieces of indigo dyed fabric. The Dogon are known for their elaborately carved doors. Local boys insisted on carrying our day pack and giving us a hand, whether we wanted one or not, in hopes of receiving a tip at the end of the day. Porters carried all of our gear, including wooden tables, sleeping mats, chairs, and cooking equipment. While it looks like impossibly hard work to us, they are more than happy at the chance to earn some money. Tables, chairs, and mats are set up not just at night stops, but at our long lunch stops as well. 
Every day, we got a three-hour siesta before setting off again. The village of Irelli is a World Heritage Site with an elaborately painted town square used for major celebrations. How in the world did the ancient Telem reach these cliff dwellings? The Dogon theory is that they could fly. Today, the Dogon use ropes to lift the dead to their final resting places. In Dogon culture, men are the weavers, although women prepare the cotton thread and then dye the finished product. We visit a sacred crock pond outside a village whose totem is the crocodile. And reach our final camp at the village of Torelli. Here, we've made arrangements to view a mask dance. The Dogon perform this dance once every three years usher the spirits of the people who have died out of the village and into the world of the spirits. After we are seated on large rocks surrounding the dance area, the old men of the village file in. They begin pounding out the beat of the dance. The dancers enter, and it's clear that while performing for tourists is a way for the village to earn money, it's more like a dress rehearsal for the dancers than a watered-down version. Without a doubt, it's the most exotic and authentic thing we have ever seen.
In awe, we leave for our final trip up the escarpment. As we climb, we can see the results of a pilot program to reduce soil erosion by planting ground cover. At our lunch stop, we say our heartfelt thanks to our porters who made this trek possible. We also bid farewell to our cook, Amanji, and our local guide, Dow. Here, on top of the escarpment, we find spots of green along a tiny stream with dammed up pools. The big crop is onions, with minute plots of other vegetables. A nice hotel with showers, although no hot water and a cold beer are the perfect end to a great trek. As we leave Dogon country the next morning, we are struck by how vast the onion fields are and the amount of labor needed to water them. Back in Bamako, we toured the metal recycling area where blacksmiths take metal that would otherwise be thrown away and turn it into useful items. Until recently, blacksmiths and their noise were spread throughout the city. Several years ago, they were moved into one area. Blacksmithing is an art passed from father to son and is considered a task in Mali. Today, however, some non-blacksmiths are taking up the trade as blacksmiths earn a good living. Some of the blacksmiths make a new style of wood stove that uses less fuel. However, few people use them as they are more expensive, heavier, and more fragile. We note that one of the blacksmiths wore a hat with the colors of the Malian flag. And, as we rode around town, we noticed far more flags waving than when we had left Bamako two weeks before. Flags are even being sold on street corners. It turns out that Mali is playing in the finals of the African Cup of Nations this evening. It's the soccer match of the year for Mali. Everyone is showing support for the team, despite the fact that their chances are slim against a strong team from Nigeria. We root for the Mali team, and the game ends in a 0-0 tie. 
causing great celebration for the Malians. We watch our final sunset over the Niger, happy we decided to visit this struggling but special country.